My name is Jenny Wilde. I'm a senior associate solicitor here at Ridouts. We specialise in advising providers of health and social care services in all manner of regulatory issues. This short video is going to cover CQC inspections and what we want to do for our clients and anybody watching this film is inform them of what to expect during a CQC inspection. Providers of health and social care services are the most concerned with providing good quality care and the care of their service users is their paramount concern, which is quite right. However, regulation comes as part and parcel of that care. And so we are informing our clients of how best to cope with inspections and what to do when an inspector calls. Providers need to be empowered to understand what an inspection means, what CQC inspectors will be looking for, and how they can ensure regulatory compliance. There are rules and regulations for you as providers. There's all manner of legislation, there's guidance, frameworks, but what providers need to understand is that CQC inspectors also have that same guidance. They also have rules that they need to follow just as much as providers do. And you need to understand what those rules are and recognise when CQC are not following them. This short film is a brief run through of inspections, what you can expect before an inspection, during an inspection and after an inspection and how best to deal with the consequences of CQC's visit to your service. So, what are the main features of inspections? What do they look like? There are two types of CQC inspections, focused inspections or comprehensive inspections. A comprehensive inspection will involve CQC coming and looking at every aspect of your care home. They're the most standard type of inspection. A focused inspection is exactly what it says on the tin. It's an inspection that's focused on one particular issue that has been brought to the attention of CQC. That could be through a safeguarding alert or a complaint made to the CQC about the home. There are five key questions that CQC have to ask themselves when they visit the service. Is the service safe? Is the service effective? Is the service caring? Is it responsive? And is it well led? Later on in this film, you will see which, in my opinion, is the most important key question to the CQC and how what they find can actually be pervasive through a number of the key questions. Underneath the key questions, the CQC actually give themselves prompts. This is essentially a list of questions that the inspectors will ask themselves whilst they go around the service. The key lines of inquiry are actually subject to change in October after consultation, so they're currently not, not set in stone. Each type of service will have its own key line of inquiry, for example, residential care services or community care settings. Every service has something individual and specific to the service that the inspectors will be looking for. These key lines of inquiry are available to providers. And they may download them and review them. The Chloe's contain prompts and also sources of evidence that will be used by inspectors to look at your service. Essentially, it's an internal checklist. In their own guidance, CQC inspectors are actually encouraged to devise their own prompts. They are not exhaustive and they may invent a prompt as they go around your service. According to the Chloe's, an inspector should use those key lines of inquiry and questions to plan your inspection. What they will do is devise a list before they visit the service and then look at your service in line with what they have in mind. They might tell themselves that they're looking for particular things. They will liaise with their inspection team. They will liaise with the inspection manager to determine what precisely they are looking for in that inspection. This will be informed by any feedback that they've had from external people or staff at your service. CQC inspections have changed in recent years. They used to be very much focused on paperwork and looking at evidence. However, recently, I would say over the last two years, they have changed and become much more observationally focused. CQC used something called the SOFI tool, which is a short observation framework of inspection. And what that involves is an inspector attending the service taking a step back away from paperwork and observing practices. 
This will involve speaking to service users, just looking at how staff interact with them, how staff treat them, how care is delivered. But it's much different to what you may be used to. No longer should an inspector be sat in an office going through reams and reams of paperwork and evidence. They will be much more hands-on in terms of what they see. Part of this hands-on approach will actually involve interaction with service users and their families. What will happen is the inspectors will ask questions, they will interview staff members, service users and their families, and ask for real information about their views on the care, their opinions on the care. This can create some difficulty because CQC don't always temper those views with real evidence. We've had a number of examples where service users have said, I don't like living here, I'd rather be living in my own home. But of course, if you're an older person, for example, um, who may have dementia, you probably don't want to be in a care service, you would much rather be at your home, but unfortunately due to their condition, that's not feasible. However, when the draft report comes through, it reads, service users are not happy here, they don't want to be at the home. That's taking that opinion at face value, it's uncorroborated. There may be reams of evidence that show that that particular service user is really happy at the home, but that one statement has been taken as fact, and that's problematic. There are benefits to speaking to service users and staff members, but there are also pitfalls. The benefits are real views from real people using the service. Staff members can show how happy they are working there if that's the case. Service users will be able to give the inspectors examples of what they do day to day, how caring your staff are, how well cared for they are generally. However, if their responses are not positive, this can cause a problem. One way of getting around this is knowing what people are going to say before they say it to an inspector. And later on in this film, I'll discuss how you can gather those views so that you can resolve any problems before they arise in front of an inspector. One way of avoiding staff members' feedback being a surprise to you is by conducting regular meetings with your staff team. If staff members have an issue, I'm sure that providers would much rather hear about it in the first person at a meeting or a catch-up session than the staff member going directly to the inspector and telling them what's happening at the home if they have a negative opinion of something that could have been resolved on a one-to-one -one basis. Communication is absolute key. So as we've covered, reviewing records is less important to CQC. Seeing care in practice is much more prevalent. They will put much more reliance on that in the inspection report. And that's why it's very important for providers to ensure that what's happening on the day is what should be happening. Staff members are stepping up to their duties and service users are enjoying their time at the service. So what happens before the inspection? The inspections that we've discussed are unannounced, so you will not know when CQC are coming to your service. You can get a bit of an idea because what CQC tend to do is send to you a PIR form. A PIR form asks you for information about your service. It's almost like a questionnaire and it's for CQC to gauge how you're doing, what you're doing and where you think you are on the regulatory scale. Providers need to be careful with the PIR form because it's essentially a self-declaration. If you complete the form and tell CQC that you believe you are compliant with the regulations and then they visit and find that you're not, it doesn't look good. That will probably see you marked down in the key question of well led because you didn't realise that you weren't compliant and ticked that you were. CQC aims to send PIR forms to providers annually but they won't always send them. You are statutorily obliged to respond to the PIR. One of the regulations, Regulation 10 in fact, states that you have to return it if it's submitted to you. If you don't return it, you will be penalised and it will be recorded in your inspection report. We want to empower our clients to be as prepared for inspections as is possible. We've already noted that you won't know when CQC are coming, but all providers are regulated and so should be aware that they will receive a visit at some point from CQC if they provide health and social care activity. Our motto is to be forewarned, 
is to be forearmed, but how can you do this if you don't know what CQC are looking for? I've already mentioned that all providers have guidance that relates to their particular type of setting and relate to the regulated activities that they're providing. But what does CQC have? What's their guidance? And how can you find out what they're looking for, how they should conduct themselves? Actually, you can do that. Some evidence is available on the CQC website of what an inspector will be looking for. You should be familiar with provider handbooks. These are unique to every type of setting and there is an appendix to these handbooks that contain some really valuable information that you can use in advance of an inspection. The appendix to the provider handbook contains characteristics. It shows you what an outstanding service should look like, it shows you what a good service should look like, requires improvement and inadequate. It's incredibly useful in gauging where you are in terms of what CQC expects to find. In addition to this documentation, we at Ridouts have been able to obtain further documentation that's not publicly available. We had to do this through a Freedom of Information Act, where you formally write to the CQC, ask for something specific, and fingers crossed they send it to you. What we've managed to obtain is an inspector's handbook, which is essentially some guidance that the inspector has to follow, and also some report writing guidance, which shows us the rules and regulations that CQC have to follow whilst they're writing your inspection report. This comes in really handy when you're looking at your draft inspection report and you're comparing it to how CQC should have written it. The guidance for inspectors is more to do with how the inspectors should conduct themselves on the day. As I've already noted, the Chloe's could be changing in October. However, they are a really useful guide, perhaps to even use as an audit for providers to determine how compliant they think they are. We always encourage our clients to run through a dummy inspection almost, to kind of inspect themselves Audits are extremely useful and providers will be able to identify any concerns that they have and hopefully remedy them before CQC come to visit. So CQC have arrived at your service, there's a knock on the door and you let them in. Fingers crossed everything goes swimmingly, they enter your service, really pleased with how fabulously in order your paperwork is. Speak to your service users who are having a wonderful time and speaking to your staff who are telling them how much they enjoy working at your service. That's the ideal scenario, but is not always guaranteed. There are some ways that you can encourage that kind of an outcome during the inspection. Some providers get their managers to prepare KPI documents. So key performance indicators are really good ways of seeing where you are, how well your staff are performing, and whether or not the outcomes that CQC want to see are being met. What's the experience like of your service users? KPI audits are incredibly useful. I've already noted how important auditing is in giving you a bit of preparation for a CQC inspection. But this, having done a KPI audit, provides CQC with additional evidence that the service is well-led. So well-led, in fact, that you are prepared to do a full dummy inspection and complete documentation that helps them along during their own inspection. As already noted, CQC placed less reliance now on documentary evidence. This in itself can be problematic for reasons that I'll discuss later, but what it also means is that they will place more reliance on the interaction that they have with service users and their families. What they will do is ask questions about whether or not they're informed about their care plans, do they have an input in the care that they provide, how much are they asked about food, activities, and their family members will ask for how well you communicate with them as family members. They'll ask your opinion of whether or not your loved one is happy at the home. What we say to clients is that nothing that service users and their families say to the inspector should be a surprise. You should know exactly what they're going to say because you should always be in communication with your service users. One way that you can do this is through regular feedback sessions via questionnaires, meetings, one-to-one -one sessions with key workers. You should already know this information before it's delivered to the inspector. 
If you do know that information, you can then take steps to remedy any concerns that are raised, or you can crystallise that information in feedback forms and use it as evidence to show CQC that people's needs are being met. The same goes for staff members. They will also communicate with the inspector. Staff members can be a challenge when it comes to inspections. If they're unhappy at your service, then they will say so, and they're entitled to say so. That's why they're questioned by the CQC. What you want to know is, are there any areas that I could improve upon with my staff team before the inspector arrives? So as well as speaking to service users and their families, the CQC inspectors will engage with staff members. They will observe them performing care duties, but they will also speak to them about their experiences of the service and what they view the experience of service users as. A happy member of staff will give an informative, fulsome and helpful response, hopefully saying that they are proud to work at your service and that the care that is delivered is of high quality. An unhappy staff member might not give such a helpful answer. We encourage our clients to keep the channels of communication open with their staff members as much as possible. One way of doing that is by conducting regular staff meetings, appraisals, supervisions, one-to-one -one sessions to encourage people to give feedback. This can give rise to concerns, certainly, but what it also gives rise to is the opportunity to remedy any problems that the staff may point out. I'm sure that as providers, this remedial action is preferable to a staff member going directly to a CQC inspector with an unresolved complaint. Part of good management of a service is resolving issues as and when they arise. So being proactive in finding people's opinions, both service users and staff, will be highly regarded by the CQC. What's more, evidence of such feedback will be invaluable and this should always be kept after any discussion with a service user or a staff member. Staff members can be intimidated during inspections. It's a difficult time. They're placed under scrutiny by people representative of the government and who they see as people that could close the home, essentially. So they want to perform well in front of them. Sometimes staff members can freeze and be that intimidated that they don't do themselves justice in front of the inspectors. This is an issue. Instilling confidence in staff members is key to inspection success. On many occasions, inspection reports have come back and they read that an inspector has spoken to staff member A about, let's say for example, the Mental Capacity Act, which is a very complex and challenging area of work. So this past staff member has been put on the spot, they're being questioned about the Mental Capacity Act and they freeze. They might say to the inspector, I don't know what that means when actually they attended training a couple of months prior, but they're so nervous about giving the wrong answer that they would rather just say nothing. They think that by saying, oh, I don't know, that they're getting out of it. But what happens is when the inspection report comes back, the CQC inspector has deduced that that staff member has never been trained, and that they're working with people with mental capacity issues without the relevant training. That looks bad in an inspection report, and also, it's not true. Somebody just had a bad day. If the management of a service can instill confidence in staff members, train them appropriately, and help them to prepare for a one-on-one -on -one chat with an inspector, they are more likely to do themselves justice and give a strong, detailed answer which shows that they are being well supported at the home, they're being trained, and also that they're providing excellent care to service users. Providers should not give CQC any excuse to come to a negative conclusion. If you have something positive to say about a service, the staff member should be encouraged to do so. They should be empowered to tell CQC exactly what they think about their working lives. One way of helping staff members with inspections is by conducting your own mock inspections. This will give them a flavour of what to expect. Having somebody, a third party, maybe even a consultant, attend the home and perform an inspection using the same criteria that the CQC would. Not only does this give staff members an idea of how it's going to look, how it's going to feel, but it just gives them a bit of a taste of that pressure that everybody will experience during an inspection. 
The more that staff members experience mock inspections, the more likely it is that they will give more interesting, useful and helpful answers to the inspectors. In addition, these mock inspections can identify any weaknesses in the service, as we've already noted, and those can be easily remedied before a CQC inspector arrives. On the day of inspection, a CQC inspector will be likely to roam around the service, take notes, make observations and then look at some documentation. We always suggest to clients that they have somebody assigned from the service to accompany that inspector for the whole day. I know that this seems obnoxious and most CQC inspectors will not appreciate being followed around from 8am to 8pm, but as providers, it's vital that you have somebody on hand, not only to help the inspector, but to help you as a provider. I've seen far too many reports where CQC inspectors have said, well, I was looking for this document, but I couldn't find it, therefore it doesn't exist. And actually it turns out they never asked a member of staff to find it for them, they never asked for help. Had they done so, they would have been provided with the document instantly. That's why it's important to have somebody on hand who can address any concerns that the inspector has. In addition, we would advise that that person takes a detailed note during the day of any points that the CQC inspector might raise. This could come in useful after the inspection and we'll cover that later. If the person assigned to the inspector hears of any concerns that the inspector might have, they should refer this to the services manager immediately and they should be brought to the inspector to see if they can resolve any issues that have arisen. So you've gone through the day, the inspection is over, everybody's feeling slightly frazzled by the scrutiny and that's understandable. But what you need to remember is that the job is not yet done. CQC have a responsibility to deliver to you a full feedback session. During this session, we suggest that clients send into the meeting a senior member of staff, be it the manager or if there's an area manager at the service at the time, that would be very useful because what's going to happen is that CQC are going to give you a breakdown of what they've found during the day. CQC do not give you an indication of what their outcome will be. They should not tell you what it will be because they have yet to draft the report. We found that sometimes an inspector will say, well, I would have given you good if not for this, but they shouldn't really do that. The guidance that we've managed to obtain through freedom of information requests actually states that the feedback you're given after the inspection should make sure that nothing that you get in your draft inspection report is a surprise. If you get your draft inspection report and there's lots of information in there that you've never been told about, then in our view, that can be challenged. During the feedback session, you will be absorbing a lot of information. You'll be keen to know how the inspection has gone, but it's vital that somebody is there taking a detailed note of what the inspector is saying. This will be very useful in the days after you get your draft inspection report. An inspector is obliged to give to you a completed summary sheet of the inspection and sign and date it. You should make your own note of the summary and also of the feedback session. So the feedback session is over and now you have to wait patiently for your draft inspection report. Once that arrives, you have 10 working days during which to comment on the inspection report. Now your comments can be based on the content of the report, the factual accuracy. So that can be minor things such as numbers of service users or the types of activities that you provide or they can be more robust challenges to the judgments that CQC have arrived at. Challenging an inspection report at draft stage is essential if you disagree with anything in that report. We always educate our clients to be empowered and not to be afraid of challenging an inspection report. I've heard dozens of times providers saying, well, I don't agree with what's written in my report, but I don't want to annoy CQC. I don't want them to hold anything against us next time they come and inspect. In my view, that has no value. CQC should be acting impartially. A draft inspection report is documentary evidence of their inspection of your service. Inspection reports are your most important marketing tool. If it's not correct, it needs to be because people will be making judgments about whether or not to use your service based on what CQC have written. Any challenge, however small, should be made to things that you do not believe are correct. 
I've already noted the smaller issues, factual accuracy points, which can be easily resolved during the factual accuracy process. But you should also be empowered to challenge things that are not corroborated by evidence. So going back to the point that I made earlier, statements from service users, their families and staff. CQC should not take these as fact if there is documentary evidence available to them that proves the contrary. If you read the report and you find a statement has been made that you know is wrong and you can prove it, then you should 100% challenge that assertion. Some inspection reports refer to service users by letter, so service user A, B, etc. When you're looking through the report, looking at making a challenge, it can be really difficult to know exactly who they're talking about. If this is the case, then you should feel confident in requesting the notes from the CQC inspector. We've had a variation of responses from CQC. Sometimes they will provide the notes, sometimes they will not. But CQC have guidance now in place, internal guidance not available to the public, that as a matter of course, they will not automatically supply notes. If you believe there's a point that should be addressed, and it can only be addressed by looking at the notes, then you should continue to challenge them for the notes. You might not be able to make a meaningful response unless you see those notes. If you need assistance with such a challenge, that's where we can assist. If you wish to look at any of the documentation we obtained through the Freedom of Information Act request, then please do contact us. We'd be happy to share this with you. If there are improvements to be made to your service, then these should be addressed quickly. If a concern is raised by the inspector during the inspection, then you should remedy the point immediately. As a rule, the fact that you've remedied it should be included in the inspection report because that was action that happened during the inspection. Instant remedial action should be taken where it can. This will reduce the risk of negative inspections in the future. CQC should not be able to return to your service and find the same failings as they found at the last inspection. This will inevitably lead them to taking enforcement action. If CQC do raise point of concerns with which you agree, you may want to consider using an expert consultant. We've already talked about audits and an independent third person like a consultant could come in, look at your service objectively and create for you an action plan that you can use to change the service and make right any points that CQC have raised. This will bode really well, particularly in your next inspection in the key question of well-led. It will show that you have taken a proactive approach to regulation and that you have taken the time and expense of engaging a third party to identify any weaknesses with your service. If you feel overwhelmed with anything to do with your inspection, be it the conduct of an inspector, the responses of staff or service users, or the draft report that came after the inspection, then do contact a legal professional. We're always on hand to help you and give you guidance. We can help with factual accuracy comments or anything arising out of dealings with CQC. We want our clients to feel empowered and confident in doing a full and frank response to CQC. If a draft inspection report is not correct, then you need to make it known to them that it should be changed and you should be able to provide good solid evidence to show why that should be changed. Poor practice is not acceptable. That's what CQC would say to providers. But this is what the provider should say to the CQC. You are inspecting my service. You also have rules to follow. I want to make sure that you're looking at me impartially, fairly, checking all my documentary evidence and corroborating things where statements have been made. That is where an inspection report will be produced that's truly reflective of a service. Providers need to make sure that inspection reports truly do them justice.